Welcome to episode 61 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for a long time now. And Mike also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode is part one of a podcast series that is not a typical podcast series. We won't be discussing health and nutrition as specifically, but instead we'll be detailing our health journeys. And with that in part one today, we'll be talking about under eating, fad diets, and discovering the bioenergetic view. And this series will involve two longer episodes. It's just a two part series, but I figured that would be a better format for sharing our stories. Uh, in today's episode in specific, we will be talking about Mike's severe gut issues that led to dangerous weight loss and eventually surgery. We'll be talking about my experience with under eating to the point that basically it could have been diagnosed as anorexia and how this then shaped my health journey. We'll be talking about how doing everything that we were supposed to do ended up uh, leading us to feeling our worst. We'll be talking about how our experiences following various diets, including vegetarian and paleo and keto, intermittent fasting, low-fat diets, bodybuilding diets, and, and all sorts of others in between uh, influenced our experiences and how we navigated through them. And then we'll also be discussing our experiences with various symptoms like insomnia and low energy and cold hands and feet and low libido, anxiety and depression, hair loss, joint pain, bloating, weight gain, allergies, histamine intolerance, psoriasis, and viral and fungal issues, uh, as well as what led us to Ray Pete and the bioenergetic view of health. As always, to check out these show notes for today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. And if you are maybe experiencing some similar symptoms that we experienced on various diets. Maybe you're on one of these diets now and you're struggling. It's not working out kind of how you thought it would. Or maybe you're dealing with any of the specific symptoms that we experienced, whether that's insomnia or low energy or cold hands and feet or anxiety and depression or low libido or bloating or weight gain or allergies or uh, maybe an autoimmune issue or histamine intolerance or viral or fungal or bacterial issues. Or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms or any chronic health conditions, again, whether that is an autoimmune issue or something like diabetes or heart disease, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and therefore resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And with that, let's get started. All right. So there were a few reasons why, uh, you know, we decided that we wanted to have this podcast discussing our stories in, in a little more detail. One was, you know, it's something that we've been thinking about for a while, but also there's a you know a few questions I've gotten uh, in terms of Q&A as far as our questions go. So Jack had asked about our stories and struggles and successes. And I know when I'm talking to clients a lot as well, sharing these sorts of stories tends to really help with relatability and just understanding that we've had a lot of similar experiences to the people that we're working with and helping. And um, I think those things are really valuable. And I think it's also just valuable to, yeah, to map out our journeys. Also, not only our own health, but also how it related to how we saw health in general and nutrition and just questioning the things around us and, and how our mind state kind of changed uh, throughout as well. And yeah, so throughout our stories, we'll try to kind of break them up a little bit and, and um, you know, relate it to what maybe what we've seen in other people. And um, one other thing I wanted to mention too, is that prior to this episode, I, I had gone back through, I, I keep a log, kind of like a health journal, um, just of over the years. And it was really interesting to look back at that. I realized how rocky the road was, like how wind, how windy it was, how many turns there were, how clearly it was not just linear. And I think that's one of the things that people find the most helpful too, is just 
that reminder to, in one part, be patient, but also realize that it's not just so simple where you just make these changes in this particular way and everything's good and it's smooth sailing. There's always up and down and it takes time for our bodies to adapt and adjust and improve. And it was definitely the case looking back at my own journey in a lot of ways that I forgot. So I think it's actually helpful to think back also about the things that we've experienced and and yeah, symptoms we had and and how long they they went on for and what we kind of did to adjust them. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll let you start it off, Mike, and, and we'll go from there. I just want to say, I think it's, I think that if you've, I think that it can be where you just do, where you do a certain, a certain set of things and you get a rapid result and you don't have to go through all the steps that we both went through. But I think that in order to understand what things you have to do and really understand them personally and like viscerally, you have to go through those steps. Sure. So it's like, I can tell somebody now the steps that I think that would make a huge difference in their situation. And I can pick out the things that they're currently doing that are a problem and then replace them with solutions kind of easily. But that's only because of all the different things that I tried and all the different things that I went through and all the experiments and the trial and error and the, the, like keeping a journal of the different things that affected me and how they affected me and just having this attitude of like, I'm going to try this and like, we'll just see what happens uh, pretty consistently and being open to it. Mm -hmm. But it would like, it didn't start out that way. It definitely didn't start out that way. It started out, um, I guess for me was when I was a kid, my dad first started bringing me to the gym and I was playing a bunch of different sports. And basically I got into my mind that, you know, I wanted to perform better in sports and I wanted to, to do better pretty much in every area that I was, that I was focusing on. So my dad started taking me to the gym and that sort of, I guess, in, ingrained that mentality even more. Uh, Cause I saw my dad, like when he was working out and like, I saw him, he was, what he was doing at work, he was working out, whatever. So it was like, I want to get better in every year of my life. I started feeling that way, probably like 12, 13 years old. And then I basically, from there, the next extension was I started to get interested in diet because I realized probably it's about a year into it after I started working out that diet was really important and how I ate affected how I was in the gym and my sleep and all this stuff. So I wanted to figure out what was the best way to eat? What was the way that was going to get me the most results for what I wanted to do? How was it going to be the healthiest and I was going to be the strongest and I was going to, my brain function was going to be the best and all this type of stuff. So I started having these thought processes when I was probably like 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And so then I started basically, I was like, okay, let me go online. So I started looking online and what was the, the best way to do things. And I found a whole host of different things, different articles, different points of view. But I, I started with the bodybuilding stuff because I was working out and I figured that was going to give me the best, the best result. So I got into bodybuilding. I got into the bodybuilding diets, the, uh, and it would sort of align with what I was already doing when I was a kid with my family, which was every meal was a meat, a starch and a vegetable. And so basically that's what I, that's what I did. That's what I started with. Mm -hmm. And I was doing okay with that for a while. I put on weight pretty easily. Uh, I got like put on muscle pretty easily, especially because I was young and I was working out consistently and I was eating pretty well. And then, but I was still having some like lingering issues. And so I started to like veer off into more, I guess, how do I want to say it? more extreme, more extreme or alternative diets. Yeah. So I started because the symptoms I was still dealing with at this time was I was still getting a little bit bloated and I was getting tired after my meals. So I'd have like a heavy starch meal and I would just be like, I would get about maybe 45 minutes, an hour after I would get very sleepy mm -hmm. and I didn't like how I was feeling with that. So I knew something wasn't right. Just in, intuitively at that point, it's like, I shouldn't be feeling like this. Like I, I need to be able to focus. I need to be able to do my work. So I was part of, I was working at like a health food store for, for a little while when I was in high school. And essentially I, uh, I started looking into all these different things and I started going down the rabbit hole and I started going down the rabbit hole with Dr. Mercola's stuff. That's who was like very prominent at this time. Um, he was one of like the, I think the first 
prominent health researchers that was like putting out tons of stuff, at least that I found. So, and at this point in time, he was talking about juicing. He was talking about the importance of whey protein and glutathione and uh, plant-based diets and raw. And so I was getting on board with, with a lot of that stuff. I was still eating eggs and chicken and whatnot, but I started juicing a lot of vegetables and mostly vegetables actually. And then eating a lot of raw, a lot of raw vegetables and a lot of legumes like specifically sprouted lentils uh, because I also looked into some of the Weston A. Price stuff. And then I was taking a lot of protein shakes because Dr. Mercola was saying whey was good and the bodybuilders were saying whey was good. So I was doing that. And while I was doing all this stuff, I was actually getting worse. (laughs) I was getting a lot sicker uh, when I was doing this. I wasn't as bloated, but I was getting getting a lot sicker. Um, And eventually I was getting pretty bad abdominal pain after I was doing all this juicing and eating all these whey protein shakes and whatever else. And so it started for a little while and then it went away and then it would start to come back. And eventually it got to a point where I was like pretty sick and I was getting like nine out of 10 abdominal pain bent over on the, over a chair on the floor, like couldn't eat anything because the pain would start. So I started only eating one meal a day so that I could go to school in the morning and like get through my classes and do my workouts Mm -hmm. and whatever else I was doing, playing basketball. And then eventually I would come home and then I would eat only eat dinner. And cause I would have, and I'd eat dinner around like seven or so because I would have pain for about five hours on average, maybe three, four five hours. Sometimes it was even longer. So if I ate dinner at seven, I can go to sleep by 12 essentially because the pain would stop. And so I went to like, I went to doctor's appointments. I went to, I was going to see, I went to see my primary care. And then after that, I went to see a GI specialist. And so I kept going to all these GI specialists and they were just saying, oh, I just have heartburn or, and, but they kept, they scoped me, uh, I think two or three times and they found absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So it like, it couldn't, and I didn't feel like it was heartburn because the pain wasn't there. So yeah, I was just, and I was, at this point I was gotten really low. I was feeling like quite, quite sick. And I had, uh, I had lost, I think about 40 pounds of weight. And so I went from, I don't know, maybe 175, 180 pounds to being like 145 pounds about there. And when the weight that I had lost wasn't body fat, because when I was 175, 180 pounds, I wasn't fat. Like it was weight from being in the gym, from lifting. I got a decent amount of muscle on me. I was pretty strong when I was at, at this point and or at that point, And then I just like completely degraded. But while I was doing everything, I kept doubling down on if, if, you know, if juicing is good, more must be better. If whey protein shakes are good, more must be better. If legumes are good, more must be better. Mm-hmm. If green veg, raw green vegetables are good, more must be better. And I remember like while I was, while I was going to all the specialists at one point, they sent me to a cardiologist because they were wondering if like maybe the chest pain was something to do with my heart. Uh, so when I went to the cardiologist, they had taken my my resting pulse rate at, when they were doing the EKG, and my pulse was in the 40s, and at certain points, like it had dipped down into the 30s, and the cardiologist was like pretty worried, mm-hmm. um, just because of how low it was. But he eventually was just like, "Oh, it's just because you're an athlete, because you like work out and you play all these sports, like you're just in like super great shape." And yeah. like I had talked to them about my diet, and they're like, "Oh, that's the best diet that you can be on." So it was like everything was reaffirming what I was doing, except for how I was feeling. Yeah. And I just want to interject there. I mean, that idea of doubling down out, like not really considering what we're feeling, but just this idea that we know, like based on everything we're told that this is supposed to be the right way and that we need to just drive further. If we're not getting the results, we just need to drive further. I think that's something that so many people relate to. We've experienced that a lot. And one other thing that I didn't touch on earlier that I wanted to mention is just that that is like this whole mindset shift that we both experienced too. And I want to, you know, we'll kind of weave that in through as well, just how we started listening to our, listening to our bodies a lot better. And you were actually a little better at that than I was. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that because that was a little later on. But yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add that in. I just think that's such a, like such a common experience that I'm sure pretty much everybody listening to this is, has been through. But anyway, so you, so you were at the cardiologist, your pulse was really low, which is also a sign of a super low metabolism. Yeah. Definitely not a good sign. And I was always freezing. I think that's another mm-hmm. thing to point out. Like I had very cold hands and cold feet at this time. And another thing I realized at this point when I was starting to get sick like this is 
if I look back in pictures, that's when I started actually losing my hair, like in these regions. Okay. So you can see in some photos, like, cause I had my head shaved when I was in high school, when I was playing basketball, that was like the thing that you did. And plus it was easier for me. So I would just shave it myself. And you could see like this area here mm -hmm. was like, the hair was still there, but it was getting much lighter. Like it was much blonder and, and everything else was dark. So like I started losing this when I was in high school and I didn't know it until like, it took a lot of long time to show because it like happened very gradually and very slowly. And, um, like I didn't like when I grew my hair fully out, like I didn't realize it at all. So I didn't realize until I looked back in pictures when I started losing my hair, I was like, Oh, when did this actually start? Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that's, I think is important to point out here is that the symptoms some of the symptoms didn't become fully apparent to me until years down the line when I actually became aware of them, but they had been going on like prior to that. Uh, and then they just sped up towards the end when I was pretty much like in like my worst state. So yeah, and the other thing I want to talk about here is despite like all of my health issues and everything that was going on, I was still working out. I was still playing sports. So I was kind of like taking a, like, like hit, hitting myself in a negative way from multiple areas. And besides like the abdominal pain that I was having and the abdominal pain was like easily nine out of 10, like extreme, like terrible, probably the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. It just like, and it was just inside, right? It was like inside my abdomen. There was nothing I could do about it. It wasn't like, you know, pain, like I broke my arm or something like that. It was like this internal dull, aching, gnawing pain in my abdomen. And I didn't know what it was. Um, so, but besides that, I was like cold all the time. My sleep was kind of bad. I was having a lot of bloating. Um, I was, my mood was absolutely terrible, especially on a plant-based diet. Like I was, I was, when I was in a uh, freshman in high school, like I was pretty much friends with everybody I had, when I was in middle school, I had pretty much met or known almost everybody in my town. Uh, and my town wasn't that small, but because I had played sports with them or I had hung out with them outside of sports or I met somebody through somebody else. So when I had, when I had, cause there was multiple middle schools in my town and then there was one high school. So I had pretty much met everybody or the, mostly everybody. And by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was friends with everybody. When I started going on a plant-based diet, I had like, I stopped talking to everybody. I didn't have energy to maintain connections. I like, completely stopped everything. I shut down all, like I didn't, I closed out all social media accounts. I had only had them since I only had like a Facebook in my freshman year of high school. I started then and then I completely canceled it out, like got rid of everything. And I was just like moody all the time. And I felt terrible and I was easily upset. And I was overall, I, like it was a complete 180 from who I was. Like the idea of who I was changed from freshman year to when I started going more plant-based in sophomore year. So in one year's time, mm -hmm. so I was overtraining. I was having terrible abdominal pain, bloating all the time. And I was doing this, like this plant-based diet. And I was doing a lot of raw things too, like raw kale, raw broccoli. I was juicing kale and spinach and I was eating tons of lentils and like making this mix of lentils and raw greens. It was bad. Overall, it was, I was like, this was probably one of the lowest points in my life. I was feeling absolutely terrible but I was doing everything that I was supposed to do. I was mm -hmm. eating the healthiest that I could eat, right? My, my, I was eating olive oil. I was eating lots of legumes. I was eating lots of raw greens. I stayed away from red meat. The only meat sources I was having were egg whites and some with, with some yolks. And then I was eating, um, I was eating chicken and that was like, and fish. And that was, that was basically my diet at time. And then like whey protein shakes. Mm -hmm. So I was eating this plant-based diet and I was just, I was crashed. I was, I was crashed and I was absolutely crushed. But again, I doubled down on it. And to go back to the doubling down, I just want to clarify also, you know, I did talk a little bit in the beginning about how things aren't linear and some people will experience some symptoms. And it's, I'm not saying that for something to be right, everything has to feel amazing all at once, but there's also a difference between that and feeling terrible overall. And like how you were saying, nothing was feeling better. I mean, I, virtually everything was worse and the things that were supposed to be better were worse. And that's a little like, that's, that's a you know sign that maybe what you're doing isn't right. And at the very least, that just means that we should at least be questioning what we're doing uh, as opposed to necessarily throwing it all out. So just wanted to clarify that because sometimes people will make certain changes 
and might not feel 100% perfect. Some things might be better, some things might be worse, and there can be various reasons for that. So it's just something that we should be examining and questioning as opposed to necessarily just throwing it all out right away. Um, the other thing I wanted to clarify again, you had mentioned the hair situation and, and part of what led to this episode was because we were talking, you know, there's that previous question about your hair loss. And so I'll link to that episode, but that was kind of something that obviously interweaves throughout your entire story from this young age. So it's so helpful to have that background context when it comes to those sorts of questions. But um, all right. So yeah, go ahead. Though the other thing was, is at this point, like I kept doubling down partly because I was like, I was figuring I have like more must be better. And everywhere I, I was being reaffirmed by doctors. I was being reaffirmed by what I was reading online. I was looking at different forums and people were like doubling down there. So like, it just like spun me into this, like into being this way and doing this way. And like, even my like teachers were like, well, they, they were seeing what I was doing and they were like, oh, it's so good that you're doing all this stuff. And so basically it's like being reaffirmed all over the place. and. The only person who was actually like throughout this whole process was like questioning it was my dad. Mm -hmm. He was just like, he's like, you sure you want to eat that much kale or like, you sure you want to eat that much broccoli? He would like say like, he would like talk about like how it was so gross and stuff like that. He was just like, no one eats raw broccoli. Like that's disgusting. <laughs> so my dad was basically, my dad was basically like, he was hinting at stuff, but again, like it was he wasn't like trying to tell me what to do. Cause I mean, that was never his approach. It was more like, you sure that's a good idea? Like just questions. Mm -hmm. But when I was in this state, like I, I had a fear of not doing things. Like once I got into this negative mind state and once like my energy was just super low, I was like afraid not to do things. And I started like getting like a bit OCD about things and mm. very rigid. And I like, I couldn't not follow it. And I was just, I was all over the, like I was, I was very, very rigid. Like I was unable to break out of that mindset. I wasn't open to new ideas or new thoughts when I was here. I was like, I was really like a lot of mental problems came out when I was doing all this plant-based stuff. Like for me, at least, like mm -hmm. I was getting depression. I was very anxious. I was easily triggered by other people. And I was um, having a lot of uh, like OCD tendencies, like, it, like they were really creeping up and they were really strong. Um. So, and that came with the more with the plant-based stuff, whereas before all the plant-based stuff, I was like pretty open and like more extroverted and like had a decent amount of friends. And I don't know, it was just a big change for me. And like looking back at it, I can see the contrast much more strongly. Whereas while I was in it, I wasn't getting it. Um, so yeah, so eventually I went to the specialist. I went to these doctors. Uh, I actually went to some alternative doctors as well, just because I was going to the GI doctors and they weren't doing anything. They wanted to put me on proton pump inhibitors and other stomach acid medication, stomach acid lowering medication, because they were saying, oh, it's just, this is just that. What Nothing was showing wrong physically. And I want to point this out for people that I've worked with, like they've had all these terrible digestive systems or digestive, digestive symptoms and the doctors scope them and often they find nothing. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point that out that like, that doesn't mean that you don't have a problem. And also my lab work, like I was like, I don't know, 15, 16 at this point, my lab work was completely fine. So there was nothing on my lab work and there was nothing like visually, visu visibly a problem from their, their scopes. But I was in like, probably like feeling one of the, like the worst I'd ever felt in my life, like absolutely terrible. And a lot of times if that happens for an adult, because they see the labs and they see the test and there's nothing wrong, they'll do exactly what they did in your case where they might prescribe, you know, they'll say, oh, it's just heartburn and they'll prescribe some, you know, yeah. antacid or, you know, proton pump yeah. inhibitor, whatever it is, or they'll say it's all psychological and, you know, give out an antidepressant or something. I went like that, that route too. Yeah. They sent me because of some of the, like my, some of the things going on, like my dad was a little worried because like the depression. So he mm -hmm. sent me to speak to a psychologist and a psychologist at this point, like offered me if I wanted to use an SSRI. And I basically like, since I was on board with all the natural health stuff, mm -hmm. the, they wanted me, the doctor wanted me to take NSAIDs and proton pumps inhibitors. And the psychologist was talking about an SSRI. And like, I was 15 at this point. I literally, I looked at them and I was like, you got all of you are insane. Like there's something wrong. I don't need an SSRI. I don't need a proton pump inhibitor. I remember like I went to the psychologist and he told me about the SSRI and I told him if he ever recommended it to me again, I would never see him again. Like <laughs> I'm not on board with it. Like I was very much anti against that stuff. 
And so like we never brought it up again. And then every GI doctor who I went to who recommended a proton pump inhibitor, I never went to them again. Like I, I was like, I want to, I want to see somebody else just cause like, that's not the problem. Like I didn't have reflux. I didn't have heartburn. It wasn't presenting like the regular symptoms. So like mm-hmm. I was, I, I was very frustrated at this point and I, like I completely lost my respect for what was going on with doctors and like none of them were listening to me. No, none of them listened to a single thing I said. They just want, they just wanted to write me a script. They weren't listening to my symptoms. They were, they, most of them would spend like max 10, 15 minutes in the room with me. And like, and then they would pass me on to somebody else or they would want to give me a script. And like, I would tell them, I remember telling doctors, like, I'm not on board with, with the, the script. The only doctor who actually spent a decent amount of time with me, well, there was two. The cardiologist spent time with me because he was worried about how low my heart rate was. Mm-hmm. Like, and then the alternative medical doctor spent a lot of, like, a lot of time with me. The problem with the alternative medical doctor, though, was that he did a lot of extensive testing. And then after he did the testing, like, he just, he, like, wrote me this whole thing for a bunch of supplements. And, like, I didn't know why I was taking all these different supplements. And, like, the things that he told me about them were just, like, very, like, there was no comprehensive understanding of what was going on. Plus, he affirmed what was, he's like, oh, your diet is immaculate. Like, your diet is amazing. Mm -hmm. He thought that I was, like, on one of the best diets. He didn't know why, whatever was going on. But, yeah, so he, like, he, we did all this, this testing and the testing that he did, like, it was just like, oh, you're low on this nutrient. So I'm going to just give you this supplement or, and so I wound up like spending, I think $600 my, or my parents spent $600 on supplements. And then I was taking like this ridiculous amount of supplements, but I was still like, keep in mind, I was bent over in pain every night, only eating one meal a day. Right. And and for doc- to feel like that and then to have doctors not giving you the time or acknowledging that this isn't heartburn or anything. I mean, it's I can't imagine yeah. how that feels, you know, or well, how my, that would have felt. My, yeah. my parents were getting angry, too, because mm-hmm. they were just like, you know, like every doctor you go to, you have a copay and then specialists you're paying more for. And it's like you're paying for this insurance and you're paying to go see all these doctors and you're not getting any like useful information or advice. And they're not, they're not even listening to your symptoms or like, they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's kind of how it was. And so the alternative doctor like listened to me more and that was definitely better. And then he actually ran more testing and he did find problems, but Mm -hmm. his solution wasn't like, it didn't make a difference for me once I started. Like I, I stayed for, I think I was, I did his protocol for about two weeks and I actually like was feeling even worse because I was taking all these pills and I was starting to get like pretty bad indigestion from the pills. Like they were really irritating my stomach, whatever I was taking. What kind of supplements were they? Do you remember? I just remember taking like, it was a whole bunch of standard, standard process products. And they were like a lot of like vitamins and mineral stuff, but they were in hard pressed tablets. Mm-hmm. And then I was also taking like, uh, there's like a bunch of obscure supplements. Um, and I don't, I, to be honest, I don't exactly remember what all of them were, but they just, I just remember like, I felt pretty sick when I was taking them too. Like now I wasn't only getting like the gallbladder pain. I was getting the, uh, like actually getting acid reflux and actually getting like indigestion and like even more bloating. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, it wasn't, I, I, it wasn't working to me. And I, at this point I, I had had it. So I went to, then I finally went to another GI doc and the GI doc was, Oh, it's probably your gallbladder. And so he referred me to the surgeon. And when I went to the surgeon, the surgeon like listened to what I had to say. And then he basically was just like, oh, it's your gallbladder and we need to remove it. And what he told me at this point was that um, your gallbladder, your bile ducts will essentially grow back your gallbladder, like create like an area to store bile and, and you, and you don't need your gallbladder and it's just like a vestigial organ and that's it. Like it's not important. And so I'll like, in my and he basically he also told me that once I did this I was going to get better and then I would be like I would be completely fine, but like I was a little hesitant because I was like I don't know sixteen at this point fifteen sixteen this stuff it took like this was going on for like over a year of going to specialists and dealing with X Y Z and still like try doing this diet and whatever else. Um, towards the end I actually fell off the plant based diet because I was feeling so terrible that. The only thing I would eat was at night, I would just eat steak. <laughs> like I would just come home and have steak for dinner. And like, and that was pretty much it. And I was just living on that. 
Uh, so I guess it was like early carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> One meal a day carnivore. You were, you were ahead yes. of the curve. <laughs> so essentially, and I just couldn't eat the plant stuff. Like it was just making me feel even worse. Mm-hmm. So, and like the juicing, I was like, couldn't, like I was vomiting after I was drinking juice at this point. Like I couldn't, I could not deal with it. I couldn't tolerate it. So, but I didn't like no one in my family had had gallbladder problems. So there was no familial genetic history. And then I was 15. I was like, like it. And plus they weren't really finding stones on the, on any of the scans and, and MRI stuff they were doing. Um, they like had me do barium swallows. They had me, they like, they looked at what was going on in the biliary tree. Uh, and it, they didn't like see too much going on. So there really wasn't anything to even indicate that there was something there wrong was with no your stones, just inflammation. Oh, there, there was, was literally inflammation. just inflammation. <laughs> That's it. So he took out, then basically they took out my gallbladder. And what they said was that there was like a lot of inflammation around the gallbladder and there wasn't any stones and there wasn't any calcification or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, okay, I was okay. Like, I don't know. It's just like, there was nothing really wrong except for the inflammation. Like what, what was causing the inflammation? And there was no answer around that. Like I never saw the surgeon again, really after I saw him once for my follow-up and I never saw him again. And no one had answers as to why I was inflamed. Follow-up after you got it removed, right? I mean, you, after I got it removed, I saw him one time. Yeah. So you got the, you got your gallbladder removed. You didn't say that yet. So just to oh, clarify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had the surgery. Yeah. They, they took out my gallbladder. I had it removed. And then like I saw the, him for the follow-up to make sure my incisions were fine. And then that was it. Mm-hmm. And then I never saw him again. And nobody like, there was no question. I was like, I asked him, I was like, why is it inflamed? He's like, oh, I don't know. And did your symptoms improve at all after the surgery? So after the surgery, I was actually wrecked for a little while. Um, because uh, just like cutting into my abdomen, like was very uncomfortable and they had blown up my abdomen with the CO2 with CO2 gas. So they could do the laparoscopic procedure. And I was just very, uh, like I could feel my organs, like my intestines sloshing around when I would roll over for like probably about a week after the surgery it was really uncomfortable. And then I had a lot of pain in my abdomen, like a lot of, like a lot of soreness and pain from all the cutting and shit they did, which I've seen a bunch of surgeries now after working in the hospital. And I just, I can't believe I let somebody do that to me. Like I just, but I didn't know. And my parents didn't know at that point either. And, and to clarify, you, so you've, you've told me a little bit about this, but you've been in, a, you've seen surgeries and they aren't very gentle to put it lightly. I've seen quite a few surgeries, um, shadowing doctors, uh, before I went to college. And then also, uh, while I was in nursing school, I had rotations in the OR. And then when I started different jobs, I had rotations in the OR. So I got to see quite a few surgeries and essentially, yeah, they're not gentle inside. They basically will cut and rip and tear whatever they need. Like they're not going to tear your intestines, obviously with a like, but it's like if they need to like they need to cut something, they just cut it and then they'll burn it, they'll cauterize it so it won't bleed. And so it's like kind of it's pretty damaging what they do inside the body. And like even some of the other surgeries I've seen where they remove like pituitary tumors, like they just go in through the nose and then they'll just rip cartilage out and just like like you literally you'll hear it pop and they'll like go through the the nose and they'll just keep drilling and they'll they'll cut as they go all the way up and then they'll burn all the areas that are bleeding. And then when they get to like the, the skull, they'll drill and then they'll, they'll like cut open the sack for the tumor and they'll use like high pressure suction to pull it out. So it's like pretty, pretty brutal, uh, how these things go and like pretty traumatic on the body, at least from my perspective. Um, so yeah, so it was basically, I was pretty bad after the surgery for about a month. Like I was, pretty sore, like really uncomfortable. And then after that, I actually like the abdominal pain was gone. I'm not going to lie. Like I didn't have any more gallbladder pain, but I Mm -hmm. I also like at this point, like I was done with the plant-based stuff. Like while I was sick in the bed, like I spent time contemplating on what I was doing. I was like, yeah, I probably made myself sick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I stopped juicing. I stopped whey protein. I basically stopped everything that I was doing there. And then I was just like, I didn't know what to do for a while. So I just like went on what I thought to myself was like, what, how do I want to eat? Like, what, what do I actually want? Like what makes sense to me? And I was like, the things that I know work for me are white rice and 
meat and then I like cooked green vegetables. And so I settled on that for a while and I was doing okay with that. And then like I would have, I would, I would cook with fat. Like I would cook with butter and I would use olive oil on like the veggies and stuff like that. And so that was my diet for a long time after that until I started um, probably for like a, like a few months or so until I started uh, the white rice was still making me a little tired after I ate it. So <laughs> then I started uh, looking into like paleo and keto stuff. Um, and I was like, maybe it's the carbs, right? I, right. My, my thought process was I'm like, if I were, like, I know I get tired after I eat the white rice specifically. I figured that out. So I was just like, it's the carbs. So then I went low carb and then I started doing keto and it was just butter, olive oil, meat and greens. And that's where I went. Um, and I did that for a while and I actually felt a lot better doing that. I wasn't getting tired after I ate my, I wasn't bloated at all. I wasn't, uh, having digestive issues. Like my digestion was probably the best, some of the best it had ever been. Mm -hmm. The only problem was I was like, Sometimes I would get like, it was like slight constipation, I guess, just because I was eating a lot. It wasn't fully keto, right? Because I was still eating a lot of meat. So I was getting a little constipated from having a lot of meat and, uh, and like the greens sometimes didn't solve it. So at that point I was adding in carrots actually, and that would, that would help the situation. So I was doing that for a while. I felt a lot better, but after a period of time, like I started to get really cold hands and cold feet again, and I would get a like I was my mood was much improved but I was getting like adrenaline rushes pretty consistently and I was having a hard time sleeping that was those were like the big ones for me but at this time my libido was excellent like my libido was great my focus was great I was getting a lot of things done I could study really well like I was very clear um but yeah I was just this my sleep was one of the biggest things and also my performance in the gym was kind of like tailing off like it got pretty bad after a while like I wasn't I wasn't growing I wasn't producing any gains uh I wasn't gaining a lot of I wasn't able to really gain weight mm -hmm. and uh, I was pretty lean and then I started basically finding intermittent fasting and then I started doing intermittent fasting and keto together and then intermittent fasting actually made those things worse so my sleep actually got worse. My performance in the gym actually got worse. I got more lean. So at this point is when we did together in college, we did that testing together. And I think I was like 6% body fat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, so this, this, these last few things that you mentioned as far as the lower carb. So first you had the, the protein and white rice and cooked veggies. That was throughout kind of the end of high school. Right. And then yeah. you got more into the low carb and intermittent fasting through like freshman year of college. And that was yeah. right before, right kind of before we met. Uh, well, I found, I had found lean gains and then mm -hmm. I saw Martin Birkin and like how he looked and like what he was doing. And I thought that intermittent fasting was like going to make a, a huge difference for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it did make me a lot leaner. Right. I was like super lean. I was like, I don't know, like but when we tested, I was like 6% body fat in the bod pod, which was what electrostatic testing or yeah. hydrostatic. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember how they. I don't remember what the the how they actually do the the bot pod testing. Um, I don't think there's anything electrostatic because I think it's. I think it was, well, it was it was looking at electrostatic versus hydrostatic uh, uh, testing, right? Because they were comparing us in the bot pod versus when we did the uh, the uh, the it was like where you stood there and you hold you held the thing in your hands and it ran the electrical current through and told you the different percentages of body fat and gave you the report and everything. I don't think I don't think there's any bioelectrical impedance with it uh, that was actually used for the testing. I could be wrong, but I I mean I just pulled it up right now that the bod pod they use an air displacement plethysmograph, but basically they're looking at like volume versus weight and density by putting you in like a sealed chamber where they can measure all of those things and they use that to determine. What I'm saying was they did the bod pod mm -hmm. and then they then in our in the study we were taking part in mm -hmm. and they compared that to the electrical impedance. Oh yeah, yeah, def yeah, yeah. So the yeah, but the bod pod was like the accurate. You know, they knew that as like the kind of the gold standard. Yeah, and that they were testing to see if it was still the gold standard. We were taking part in the research. We were like participants. Yeah, I think they were trying to see how close bioelectrical impedance was to like the gold standard bod pod. Yeah, and so that was that was what the beginning of sophomore year. No, that was the end of freshman year of college. That was before we started. We started living together. Okay. I didn't even remember that we were that close of friends at that point. Well, we had, we had realized that we were going to be roommates the next year. And then 
And then we started like doing, cause we, we had started talking and we started realizing, oh, you're doing intermittent fasting and keto and you're interested in all that too. And like Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield and all the Chris Cresser and mm-hmm. all the paleo keto people. Right. We right, had like, yeah. we were like talking about all their stuff and like, we were the only guys on our floor who were into it and reading it and everybody else just wanted to party and get drunk and, and like, yeah. And then I had like the whole crock pot in my room so I could like <laughs> cook my meals and I had like my fr- mini fridge cause I wouldn't eat the university food cause it was too high in vegetable oil. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was, that was, uh, the end of freshman year then when we were doing that. And so, yeah, so you were extremely yeah. lean at that point, as you said, like 6%. Yeah. And I was, and I was pretty muscular too, but mm-hmm. just very, very lean. And then that's when we started. Um, we did both of us did that for a while together up until like somewhere in sophomore year, where it was like, I think we were both like, we're tired of, and especially me, I was like having the sleep issues and whatnot. And then I was starting to have like serious sugar cravings and serious like carbohydrate cravings. And then I was starting to like binge on the weekends on carbs uh, just because I was like, super i felt super depleted um Mm -hmm. and this is when we started doing like paleo high starch right why why don't we pause here if that's okay and i'll kind of give my background up to this point because you know okay because we'll we do the rest of it together yeah yeah the rest of it we're pretty much together yeah (laughs) Yeah. okay so yeah so that so that was when we met so backtracking um my my earlier days which i mean we're there's a lot of parallels with yours but the route that I went down tended like if you were to kind of summarize it, it was much more down low calorie as opposed to plant based. Uh, Whereas you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you always ate a decent amount. You always kept your calories up at least as much as you could minus the fasting sort of thing. Yeah, I was tracking it. I was tracking my protein specifically, even when I was trying to do plant based stuff and I was making sure I was eating enough eggs and chicken and stuff like that so that Mm -hmm. I was like still maintaining something. Yeah. 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 So my health journey began at a similar time to yours right around 12 or 13 and it also started in the gym which similar to you came from you know role models that i had had who i saw were at the gym and were muscular and obviously you know those are the as a guy something you look up to and so that got me started with wanting to lift weights and so started in the gym and then much like with your experience mike wanting to use nutrition as a compliment of course you know just wanting to learn as much as uh, as much as you could to make sure that you're getting to where you want to go. And I had a lot of trouble putting on muscle for a while. And part of this was because I was pretty lean, like I was skinny, but I didn't have, I didn't naturally have abs. And so I, and I wanted that. I mean, everybody who, you know, any of the fitness, <laughs> fitness models, any of the, the, you know, ripped guys that you look up to that, that the abs is the biggest part, <laughs> at least it was for me. So because of that, I, you know, I knew I was, I was working out at least four days a week and I never missed, you know, whether I was on vacation, whether I was out of, you know, then I would just do my workouts earlier. I would go way out of my way when I was out of town to still get to a gym. I was very regimented at least four days a week doing, you know, the typical bodybuilding split and for, for years, but I was not eating enough because I was wanting to, I was wanted to have those apps. And I felt like, you know, what I was taught in my health class, I remember this very clearly was all the very detailed explanations of the calorie equation. And if you want to go from any sort of overweight or not ripped to ripped, then eating less is, is the very clear only way to do it. And so I took that to an extreme and, and when it wouldn't work, I would double down and it, it got pretty bad where this must've been, I must've been 13, uh, like seventh going into eighth grade that summer. Uh, I was playing football and this might have even been the year prior it was one of those you know somewhere around then um where i was playing you know i was going into the football season i think it was probably going into seventh grade um yeah and i and and the you know so we would have like workouts in the summer every afternoon for a few hours it was maybe like two to four thirty or something in the afternoon but i was really under eating at this point because i wanted to to get abs and so what I would do is I would stay up really late at night playing video games on my computer so that I would wake up really late in the morning. So it was closer to practice time. So I didn't have to eat as much earlier in the day because I knew that if I woke up earlier, I would be hungrier and I would want to eat uh, earlier in the day. So 
I would wake up late, you know, maybe like 10 or 11, and I would have a protein bar that I remember was like a sugar-free, carb-free protein bar with maybe like 20 grams of protein. And then that would be all I would eat until I would walk to practice, walk to football practice. I would work out throughout the whole afternoon, do the fo- you know, play football, uh, which was intense workout. And then, uh, and I would come home and I would eat dinner with my family and I would just like try to get by eating, you know, some amount of protein, some veggies and whatever else was there. I, I wasn't concerned about like macronutrients, even at that point, carbohydrates versus fat or anything. I was just kind of eating, but I just wasn't eating a lot. And that would be all, all I would eat on these intense summer, hot, like hot summer days playing football for a few hours and I would eat a low calorie, like low sugar protein bar and a small dinner. And I remember I was also, I was the lightest on the team and I was in like the slightly heavier, um, like the football was split into two weight classes. So I was in a higher weight class, but I was taller than most of the kids on my team. And I was the lightest one on the team. And another thing I remember from that year, which was the first year I played football, I came home from the, f- the first two weeks of practice, uh, the first two weeks of practices, which was the first time I'd ever played football. My arms were covered in bruises, like from the top of the shoulder down to like mid forearm was just fully bruised. And I, I think it was just, you know, the impact, like, which, you know, on one hand, there's going to be some adaptation to it, but also I was just not doing too well health wise. I was not recovering well. I wasn't, you know, I was, I'm sure I was always really sore and yeah. So that was just kind of the place that I was working from. And from there, as you could expect, I was not, uh, putting on muscle, you know, as I continued to work out past then. And I was just in this constant restriction mindset. And then any time there would be a family event where there was like a lot of food out or cookies or brownies, and I would let myself go a little bit, I would just binge. Um, and it was, this wasn't like that frequently, but I would binge. I would eat, you know, eight brownies or something. Or if it was late at night on a weekend and I was uh, watching TV, I would have like a bag of, cho- I would like go grab a bag of chocolate chips and I would finish maybe like the whole thing or like three quarters or something like that. And it tasted bad, but like by the end, they're like, does not taste good, but I just couldn't stop eating it. Um, I remember one other really funny experience where there was this, uh, trail mix sort of thing in a huge tub and in the trail mix, there was toffee covered peanuts. And I remember I would take, I took the trail mix, like the whole tub and opened it. And I picked out every single toffee covered peanut. Um, cause I was like, I just would, I couldn't stop myself. I did the same thing, except it was like dark chocolate trail mix. Okay. And I would just eat all the dark chocolate out of the trail mix and I wouldn't eat anything else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and so that around this time from the health journey side or nutrition workouts, I got into, I found Charles Poliquin and started to follow a lot of his suggestions, which involved a lot of times like mineral and vitamin supplements and fish oil and getting in a ton of protein all the time, kind of like some of the traditional bodybuilder things. He also ended up, I mean, he had quite a bit of like low carb, um, like he advocated for low carb a lot later, but I didn't get to that quite yet. So this all kind of took me into high school with this same kind of restriction, binging mindset, lean and building some amount of muscle, but nowhere near as much as I could and definitely coming at a cost. I mean, you had mentioned mood being a factor for you and I know it was for me too, just nowhere near a normal amount of patience. I would get very angry and, you know, get in fights with family and things like that. Um, but otherwise symptom wise, I don't think there was anything in particular that I noticed. I mean, I, you know, I was young and probably able to deal with a lot of the stress that I was putting myself under. Um, and that kind of carried me through until I wanted to, I was, I was in high school, it must've been sophomore year and I wanted to gain weight for wrestling, maybe a sophomore going into junior year. Um, because I didn't want to be stuck in the lower weight class. I didn't want to have to cut weight. So I decided I want to gain some, gain some weight. And this is a complete opposite mindset from where I was prior. And so I decided to look into what, you know, how to put on muscle a little bit, you know, in more depth and how to, how to put on weight. And I would find, uh, like bodybuilder and fitness model diets and they were all eating so much food, you know, all of it was kind of the, a lot of what you talked about, like rice and meat or a lot of oats, a lot of chicken, you know, of course, not as much red meat. Um, a lot of protein shakes and, and vegetables. And I saw how much they were eating, but they were, they were ripped. And I was so confused as to how they could possibly be eating like at least two, probably three times as much as I was and still be so lean. And I had friends who were like that as well. 
And I remember having one friend in particular who was pretty muscular and pretty lean. And he would tell me like, you just have to eat more. And I would, I remember like at a sleepover <laughs> with him, he would like get, he would like get a pizza or something and he would just eat the whole thing if I wasn't going to eat any, but he would like try to convince me to eat more and I would. And then I would, the next day I would be like a little bit bloated or something. And so I'd be like, no, like this is the opposite of the direction that I need to be going in. Like I can't eat more or else I'm just going to gain body fat. Um, and I, I wasn't looking at the scale. It was just looking at your belly and like, obviously I probably wasn't digesting it perfectly. And it was, I mean, it's pizza. And so like some of that bloating is normal, but I would see that. And I would think that that was just the direct opposite of getting abs. Um, but so that was like one juxtaposing thing. And then seeing these bodybuilders and fitness models was another just, um, complete juxtaposition. So that, that kind of led me to questioning things a little bit there as far as the calorie model. And it wasn't conscious. I wasn't really thinking like, maybe that's all wrong, but I was starting to think like, there's something here that's not fitting together. Like this picture isn't working. Uh, you know, it's not as clear as that. And so I decided to try it like uh, all those things together. I decided to try it. And so I created this meal plan that was like six meals a day, small like meal snacks. And one would be, you know, some oatmeal and eggs for breakfast. And then it would be like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for a midday snack. And then lunch was like a you know chicken breast sandwich and potato chips. I, again, like I didn't care what I was eating at this point. I didn't know anything as far as like nutrients really beyond like supplements and calories, I guess. Um, and getting enough protein, that was something I'd, it was, sorry. So I remember this now it was actually getting enough protein was one of the main things they talked about on the bodybuilder in these bodybuilder diets and ha carbs were fine, but it was, had to be low fat. So I remember I was actually using a low fat peanut butter at the time. Um, <laughs> that was like defatted peanuts or defatted peanut butter. I don't know how they did it. It tasted terrible. It was like gross and it wasn't like thick and creamy. It was like liquidy. Um, but I would use that for my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Sounds delicious. Yep. <laughs> On some sort of like whole grain seed bread, you know, multi grain bread. Yeah, I did those too. The Ezekiel yeah. bread. Right, right. I don't even think it was Ezekiel. I don't, yeah. But um, yeah. So, so that was like how my meals were structured. And I was eating this way and I was stuffed. Like I was so full <laughs> from eating these like six meals throughout the day. And it was like so much more than I'd eaten before. And I was like waking up in the morning and like not wanting to finish my oatmeal and eggs. Like even the first meal, I was not wanting to finish it. And I'm looking back. I know this was there was a couple of reasons. One was the types of foods I was eating. But then the other thing was that after a couple of weeks, I stuck with it. I forced it. I was forcing the food down. I was not hungry. Um, but after a couple of weeks, I, I actually adjusted and my my digestion sped up. My metabolism sped up a little bit. And I actually became hungry for the meals going into them. I didn't have to force them down. And when I calculated out how much food I was eating, it was like 2000 to 2100 calories a day. <laughs> and that was like fully regimented. Like I knew exactly what I was eating, fully calculated it out. And, um, and yeah, so that was, I mean, just comparing that to what I must've been eating before while playing football, while wrestling, you know, just being generally active, biking to the gym and working out four days a week. Um, like I was insanely under eating before that. Um, but yeah, so I, so once this happened, I actually realized I could eat more and I wasn't, I wasn't measuring body composition or anything, but I kind of didn't care. It's just like, I knew I needed to gain weight. So I was just trying to gain weight and I was just looking at the scale and it wasn't really, I don't think it was shifting as much as I thought it would. But so I, I, after I started getting used to that, I would build up those meals and actually begin eating more. And that, I mean, I don't think I was eating still enough at that point, but it was definitely more. And I stopped caring quite as much about how much I was eating and started to realize that um, eating more was helpful and, and it was safe. It was fine. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I think everybody gets to that point where you realize like, Oh, I can eat carbs. Like I remember we did that with paleo. We'll get, or with keto and all that. It's like, Oh, we won't get fat if we eat carbs. <laughs> <laughs> you see all that stuff. But uh, yeah. I want to point out something important here is that <clears throat> when you're gonna, when you're coming from a really low calorie state, I think to avoid the discomfort of trying to force feed yourself, which both of us did, I think the best way to do it is slowly add mm -hmm. it back in calories, like maybe like 100 or 200 calories a day per week and slowly go back so that you're not like, because I remember when we tried to do, we slammed ourselves with food. Mm -hmm. We did that quite a few times. Uh, I know I, it's even before I met you, I was, I tried to do that a few times and it just, it like there's always that couple weeks where you're like really uncomfortable because you're eating way too much and your body's not used to it. And yeah. 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 
and just to clarify that 100 to 200 calories like a week or like every day having an extra you know if you were eating 1500 calories go up to 1600 calories every day um, i just yeah. want to make sure people didn't think it was like 1600 then the next day 1800 then 2000 or something no no yeah just in that one week you increased by 100 for for every day yeah 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 um yeah and i, I definitely agree with that uh yeah, so that was that was like a lot of that earlier stage, and so then from there it did start to shift towards more health oriented. And I got, you know, I was still following Charles Poliquin, and he was talking more and more about low carb, and he was also very much a fan of like, uh, like quinoa, I think, and uh, I don't remember exactly if this. I think I think he was a fan of like quinoa and some of the complex carbs, and I was definitely getting that from all the mainstream health stuff too. So I started to get into that. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was, I'm agreeing. I had yeah, the same yeah. thing. I was trying that, but I was not feeling good with that. Right. Yeah. I remember feeling really full with those things. And um, so I was doing a lot of the whole grains. I was doing quinoa and I got my parents, you know, cooking quinoa and brown rice. And this was the start of me like manipulating our food, <laughs> getting my parents <laughs> on board with all of it. Um, I also started doing a lot of raw nuts and seeds, which, which was something from Charles Poliquin. And I started doing these meat and nut breakfasts which was <laughs> I remember that yeah the meat nut breakfast was the absolute worst thing I ever did like taste what I just hated it but I would force it down I was like you know I wasn't getting enough sleep because I would you know stay up late doing homework or just not prioritizing sleep enough you know especially when you're playing a sport and then I would wake up and I wasn't that hungry and to force like meat and nuts like I would do like an elk steak or like I don't know I was like I would do venison and I would just do like regular beef or lamb and I was so full and just choking it down and uh kind of favoring the lower carb a little bit oh it was, it was really bad and and so that was going into my uh my last year of wrestling and like throughout that year of wrestling and so that year i uh there was so over the it was like over winter break i ended up getting really really sick and i'm sure part of this was like run down with wrestling plus not eating enough and so i got really sick just like respiratory fever like respiratory illness fever like flu sort of symptoms i guess and i lost like 10 pounds so i went from about 182 ish to 185 down to 170 and for wrestling my weight class was 182 but at that point they push it up a few pounds to like 185 so i was 170 and i was tr and this was right before or like just before the state series and um and so I had to try to gain this weight back and I had struggled a lot. Like I put on some of the water weight that I lost. So it was maybe like 176, 178. Um, but then the other thing that happened is there was two of us that were wrestling at the same weight class and it ended up that I had to bump up to a higher weight class. So I ended up having to wrestle against in like a 200 pound weight class. And I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to gain weight for like a month going into this and I couldn't like I ended up wrestling in that 200 pound weight class weighing around like 180. I don't, I don't even think I was at the limit for the lower weight class. Uh, I was like 180 ish and um, wrestling people who were cutting down to 200. So they were like, you know, maybe 205, 210 or something. And uh, I mean, it did all right, but it was I just remember that sticking out to me. Um, and I definitely think not being able to eat enough because of forcing all the like raw nuts and seeds and the quinoa and the whole grains and. The meat and that breakfast, the, those things were definitely not helping. Um, yeah, I remember the meat and that breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember not liking nuts. I just remember yeah. like the only nut I liked was Nutella and peanut butter. <laughs> and then like, and then like cashews. And then like, I hated almonds and I hated walnuts and mm -hmm. I hated pecans. Like I didn't like the way they taste. Mm -hmm. And, but I remember like, oh, it has your healthy omega threes, yada, yada, yada. So I would eat them. But yeah. all I really wanted was like the sugar and the peanut butter, or like the chocolate and sugar and Nutella. Right. And then I, I don't know. I just like the taste of cashews. Yeah. And it's one thing if they're like roasted and salted, but these, I don't know if you were doing raw too, but like, yeah, raw almonds or, um, I was doing, yeah, pecans, hazelnuts, Brazil nuts, uh, walnuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I did not feel good. like I, I did not like them at all. I didn't You're right. I out. only liked the cashews roasted and salted. Right. I did not like them raw. Yeah. <laughs> so I basically <laughs> just like the salt. <laughs> right. I like the fat, the oil. Um, I definitely wasn't feeling good when I was doing a lot of nuts either. Mm -hmm. Though I remember being super bloated by some of the nuts. It was like, and like feeling super, very heavy and very like disgustingly full. Yeah. 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 I remember loving Nutella though. 
Yeah, I never, I never got into Nutella. That would have had way too much sugar for for me at the time. I was very into reading labels, and that actually, so that brings me into the next thing. So I ended up doing towards the end of my senior year of high school this research paper. Maybe it was a little earlier. Maybe it was like the end of junior year, early senior year. I don't remember. Uh, I ended up doing this research paper, and I did it based on sugar and Robert Lustig's um, presentation that had just come out about. It was titled, I think it's Sugar: The Bitter Truth, and it had just come out around that time. And uh, so, and I was, you know, on this, I was all into health. And so I started reading about it and it's, it's actually, I mean, it's, we've talked so much about why it's not valid. And so I'll think back to all those studies and articles. And I actually ended up writing some of my articles I would write were based on like counter arguments to his. Uh, but I was, you know, didn't understand these things anywhere near to the extent that we do now. And that makes it really difficult to parse out what's true and what's not, especially if you're not listening to your body at the same time. So I remember yeah. advocating fully against sugar and uh, he proposed a sugar tax, I think, at the end of his presentation as the solution to get people to eat less sugar and, and or as a soda tax to get people to eat less sugar and drink less soda. And I want to say I was probably in favor of it at the time. Um, <laughs> it's like a means of of shifting behavior. I don't remember if I actually was or not, but. Uh, I definitely remember doing that presentation and being so interested in all of it and and so staunchly anti-sugar and not you know, never having any soda. I definitely wouldn't have had Nutella or anything. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but those things, so that all kind of led into college. And so, you know, freshman year and until we met, I was still basically on a lower carb and I had started to get into more of what we talked about, more of the paleo people, Dave Asprey and uh, Mark Sisson and, and Chris Kresser and everybody. And uh fell deeper into lower carb, but was still on bodybuilding. So I wasn't doing the fasting. I was doing like six meals a day of low carb, um, kind of bodybuilding diet and working out a ton, still, still doing a lot of raw nuts and seeds that, so you had your crock pot in your fridge in your own room. And the things I had were like raw nuts and seeds and coffee, um, because of Dave yeah. Asprey. <laughs> and so, I was not eating nuts and seeds at that point though. Yeah. Like I had already determined that I was, they didn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I did them in high school. And then by the time I had gotten to paleo, I was just sort of like, I'm like, I hate raw and I hate nuts and seeds. They bloat me. They don't make, so like I started listening to myself more after, basically after I did the surgery, I was just like, I'm going to follow what makes me feel good and, and just go like largely go with that. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't learned that lesson yet, <laughs> at least not well <laughs> enough. So, uh, and I was eating dining whole food at the time too. And I wasn't thinking as much about like the oils that everything was cooked in, but my meals would be like, you know, burgers without the bun and, you know, with cheese and like a salad or something like that. And I remember when I found out that the oil that they used on the set, like they had oil and vinegar there. And I remember I just assumed that it was I think olive I told oil. you about it. Yeah, I you must have told me. I was the one me. who told yeah. you. I was like, bro, you know what they cook those, you know what oils they're using in there? Yeah. And you're like, no. And then I was like, it's all vegetable oil. That's why I quit the dining hall. Like I was getting sick in there. And he was like, he was like, oh, really? You were like, oh, really? And then that was the end of that. <laughs> that was just the end of the dining hall. Well, no, I was, I still ate at the dining hall. I just stopped using the canola oil that they would put on like as the salad dressing. And I remember mm -hmm. bringing the little pats of butter up to the stir fry station <laughs> and asking them to cook my food in butter instead of the oil. Um, but yeah, and I would, and I would still like, I couldn't fully commit to the low carb at that point. I guess I wasn't fully convinced. And I was also just working out a lot. And I just, I was too hungry, especially with the eating so frequently. And so I would like cheat a little bit. I was like kind of gluten free, but I would get like the, the, they had these like, uh, cakes with frosting on top as desserts. And so I would get them and just eat the tops off of them. Um, <laughs> so, and I would like eat carbs, especially after my workouts, I would get like rice and, and stuff. Um, and I'm sure. Yeah. And so, so that was like the kind of, it was like a half paleo, half bodybuilding diet, uh, with a lot of raw nuts and seeds and stuff. And then we found each other and, and between that and just the more I was reading that really got me into the low carb and, and trying fasting. And, um, yeah, I mean, you were, you were a pretty good instigator there for diving into low carb. You like, you pushed me over the edge, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, and we were working out a lot at the time and you, you were at 6% body fat. I was somewhere in the set, like right around seven. Um, I remember being, you know, we were both very, very lean at that point. We started working out together too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I did have some symptoms as as well at this point, like energy was definitely low, uh, like focus and energy and things like that were definitely low or and they got worse as we continued on. 
my libido was not there to anywhere near the extent that it should have been. Um, it was definitely low. And in speaking of hair, like at, I must have been around that time, maybe even a little earlier, maybe before college. I don't remember the people would comment on my hair in the back that it was thinning, like around the crown of my head. And, um, and I, you know, it's, it's a tough, cause I can't see that. Like, it's like, unless I'm specifically looking for it. So I would just get it from other people, you know, people would mention it. And my hair was always thin. Like I remember in, when I was 13, I had grown my hair out. So it was kind of like, uh, it, it, my hair is a little, you know, on the curlier side. And so it gets a little like froey. <laughs> and people, I remember this very distinctly that, um, like a family friend, you know, everyone would like see my longer curly hair and they would want to feel it. And I remember one of my family friends feeling it and they were like, oh, it's so thin. Like thought it was like thick <laughs> just by the way it looked um but my hair was so my hair was always thin and i don't know if that was just from the point that i started eating very little or if it was naturally thin or not but that was like kind of always there and then it, i think it started thinning in the back a lot more throughout the the under eating times and then definitely throughout the lower carb times and um yeah so so those were some of the symptoms that i was experiencing at that point beyond some of you know some other mood things as well like you had mentioned where it was, I think there was like some similar social things. I wasn't, yeah, I guess that's, that's how I would say it was like kind of similar social things and, and just not as confident, not as like, yeah, confidence was a huge one. Mm -hmm. And like, even like sense of humor and just like the, the like kind of general view of things was, was definitely a little skewed. And, um, and part of that, of course, was not physiological, but I think part of it was, those were some of the main, um, the main things that were going on for me at the time. And every, I remember also when it comes to like this line of questioning things that I was, so my degrees at the time were neuroscience and exercise physiology, which I mean, continued with those degrees. And I remember everything I would learn in my exercise physiology classes was all very mainstream, all like the whole grain veggies, a lot of PUFA, you know, a lot of omega threes and the omega sixes are fine too. They're way better than saturated fats. Like those are the healthy fats. Uh, and it was all the things I had just come from, like all of the whole grains, all the quinoa, the nuts and seeds. That was what my professors were telling me was, was, or were teaching that was, um, helpful. And I remember, and I want you to share some of this too, but I remember asking questions. Like I would write, I was, you know, again, we were low carb keto at the time. So I was writing everything from that perspective, but I would like ask questions about it or, you know, write little note, like write things in the answers for certain questions or be a little, um, what's the word? Provocative. Yeah. Yeah. A little provocative and never like my questions were never really addressed and it. That was definitely one of the points where I really started questioning what I was learning and separating myself from those things and trying to look more objectively to me, which was still like, you know, my, as far as my education and understanding physiology, there was very little early college. And as far as everything we were doing health wise, like the arguments that were generally made in favor of low carb and keto and things were very, very surface level and just built around like claims as opposed to physiology um and so i guess i mean i'll, I'll kind of mention this now as far as danny roddy goes because this was around this time but i remember following dave asprey in the low carb crowd and you know you were just told like insulin's bad carbs raise insulin so carbs are bad um you know obviously sugar's the devil it's like refined and it you know i had already known robert lustig's talk about how bad sugar was even though i didn't understand any of like the detailed physiology there um so it was just very surface level arguments and i remember dan coming across danny roddy's video at this point right around this point uh that was kind of trashing keto and i was talking about carbon dioxide and stress hormones and metabolism and thyroid and uh and like i just remember having no concept of what he was talking about and i didn't do anything from that video like we didn't find danny roddy really until later but i remember having had come across that video prior uh and just it kind of set off a bit of a line of questioning and some doubt because i knew that there was this whole realm of of thinking of things that i did not understand it was nowhere near what i was really thinking about um but then we found him you know, so yeah i guess i'll i'll leave when we actually found him too a little bit but i think that kind of catches us up too when we were kind of at the same point we both were really digging into low carb questioning things and not really experiencing benefits from low carb like we we were some benefits but then a lot like the benefits initially happened yeah and yeah. then after that i think things started to slowly get worse over time mm -hmm. especially because we were kind of well we were both strict in what we were doing mm 
Mm-hmm. So there wasn't any of like willy nilly like, oh, I'm well, at least to start there wasn't. And then eventually it was like, I just like I'm just craving carbs so strongly right now. And then we started uh, like adjusting from there. But yeah, but that was a while later. Yeah, I think for me, I I didn't have it as potently as you because I didn't I didn't. Um, you didn't keep protein low. But yeah, I didn't keep protein low because I didn't fully follow keto. Cause mm-hmm. I was like very hungry still. My body was like, tell- like telling me. So I was like eating a lot, a lot of protein. Yeah. Like a whole chicken. <laughs> yeah. Like calculating it at like 300 grams a day of protein Yeah, just to fill in the gap for the carbs. And then I was eating a lot of fat, like a stick of butter a day type of thing. Mm-hmm. And then like, and then beef tallow or whatever, whatever other fat source I was using, just tons and tons olive of fat. Oil. So yeah, yeah. A lot of olive oil. And you got me on tracking at this point. And so I remember being like just for uh and we'll get into this more later but i remember being at about 2400 calories when we were doing and i was doing low protein too i was doing like the real keto thing and i was around 2400 calories well i was doing i think i was doing more i was definitely doing more because i was eating so much protein the other thing though is like if i was still hungry i would eat Mm -hmm. like i wouldn't stop i wouldn't be like oh i reached my limit like i was like i'm still hungry like i'm not gonna go through the rest of the night and not eat (laughs) right right so i would just like eat protein or eat something like eat something fatty i remember like straight up eating butter i remember that was like a running joke because sometimes i just straight (laughs) up eat butter by itself yeah i remember what and this was even later too even in our pd days but it's just such a funny anecdote where you would be cooking with the butter and you would like take one pat like you know you take you start with the whole stick of butter and like you'd you'd use a knife and you'd like cut off like one pat of butter it would go in the in the whatever you were cooking then you would do another and one, one and you would eat it mouth. and then you would keep adding to both like you would keep adding one to your food and once you until the whole stick was gone every time you would cook yeah i really i i still to this day like even though i i sometimes have issues with it because the whole gallbladder thing i still really enjoy butter mm-hmm. um but yeah, it just yeah, I was I remember I wasn't uh I wasn't fully following keto and I remember I didn't have as many of the negative effects that you did. Like my libido was still good and I still felt like I could work out a decent amount, but like I def I remember we both felt like we were like plateauing a little bit and that we mm-hmm. needed carbs. And then I I know for me sleep was like a big one. Like I had a really hard time with sleep. Yeah. I was like pretty wired. Yeah. Um then we started, so I think when you found, we started slowly adding in carbs because we started to realize, like we, I think we were still in the paleo sphere mm-hmm. and we found like Paul Jaminet, the perfect health diets work and some of the stuff Chris Crester was saying about that carbs may actually be important and necessary, but like, or even Mark Sisson had like the, the carbohydrate curve. Right. And so we were like, oh, like if we exercise, then we're going to need car, like we can we can eat as much carbs as we burn for exercise and then like right. we'll still be insulin sensitive. Uh huh. Yeah. And then so it would be yeah. like a hundred grams of carbs a day and it would be just after, you know, mostly around workouts and then maybe a little bit at night. It was all like paleo starches, so mostly white rice and plantains. We started. Yeah. Some plantains we started around then. And sweet potatoes. I only, I don't think I was doing sweet potatoes. Maybe you were, but, um, but then fruit, like berries, a lot of berries, because that was the only low fructose oh, yeah. fruit that we were allowed to eat. So we would start to do berries at that point, too. It wasn't low fructose in the quantities that we were eating them, though. Right. <laughs> I remember we had like the five, what was it? The five pound Costco bag of berries that was just gone in like two weekends. Yeah. Like yeah. between you and I just slamming. Our, I remember my hands were completely dyed blue yeah. <laughs> because I would just take handfuls of berries and just continually shove berries in my mouth because... I was so hungry for like, even when we were eating starches, we still craved sweets. Mm -hmm. So we still wanted carbs. And I remember we were like, like we were reading different theories on it about like the dopamine circuits and carbohydrates and like people like calling sugar or relating it to like cocaine. And then Mm -hmm. people saying that, oh, if you're still craving carbs, it's probably because you like the bacteria in your gut are creating signals to have you crave carbs and like all these rationalizations around why the body wanted carbs. Mm -hmm. And we were like going through them. And then, I mean, eventually they became jokes to us because we at one point believed in or like afterwards, we're just like, that doesn't make any sense now. Like (laughs) what, what we're even thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, we were just, I remember we just started like, we started binging uh, on the weekends on carbs. And then we were like, not, we weren't supposed to in our plans, but uh, it was like, I feel like our, 
I feel like I, I like started it a lot because I was just so my, my body was just like, I want carbs. And I was just like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm not going to sit here and try and will my way through this. And then, and then eventually like I would start slamming berries and then our other roommate would start slamming berries. And then you would be like, all right, I'm going to have berries too. <laughs> yeah, no. And this, that was what I was talking about. Like you really helped in, in the same way you instigated the low carb phase of things. You also <laughs> helped like usher in the carbs and the listening to our bodies a little more. And we did end up becoming validated in that way. But even our binges at that point were still like way less carbs than we would eat now in a single, like, like even in a morning yeah. or like half a day. Um, you know, we were doing, a, it was mostly berries, which are pretty not carbohydrate dense. And I know we would do like coconut flour cookies and we'd make like a couple Ugh. batches and like eat them all. I still remember those. Yeah. They were like tasted bad and they like, their coconut flour is almost all. They didn't taste that bad. It was just like so much fiber. Right. And since they had right. the sweet taste, we would just eat so many of them and then realize later it's like, wow, I just ate like 50 grams of fiber in one sitting yeah. <laughs> just from coconut flour and just be right. so like just disgustingly bloated. And it wasn't even yeah. like gas bloating. It was just bloated because you're so filled with with coconut flour <laughs> right yeah yeah that's yeah, yeah coconut flour is like really high in fiber yeah they didn't yeah. taste bad but like they weren't good cookies it was just good for yeah. low carb like even just the chocolate chips was you know would have been really good but yeah because <laughs> uh, <laughs> they were still pretty low carb one thing i do want to point out though is that when we switched over from when we switched over to low carb the reason at least that I switched was because I noticed benefits by dropping starches, right? Because the idea when we were coming from higher carb, our idea of carbs, well, ideally, we or our idea of carbs was that starches from complex carbs were the best source of carbs, right? Because fructose was like a metabolic poison. Mm -hmm. So everything we were eating was, was the sweet potatoes or potatoes or, or yams or plantains or white rice and white rice was actually i think we were considered that like junk food at the time and so right brown rice was the yeah, yeah exactly was the Bef one. this was before paleo brown rice was considered and then eventually you're like oh we, when we found paleo and the jaminates and the safe starch theories and all that then we were like oh we can probably have we can probably have white rice and then so then we stuck more towards yams and plantains i just remember for me i stuck more towards white rice and potatoes and plantains and yams in general, because I felt so terrible in grain starches. Like I had such a hard time digesting them with bloating, especially after I got my gallbladder out. And then when we started, when we started to incorporate starches again, when we kept them at lower amounts, I felt like we were okay. But then when we started increasing them more and more, and I guess this is, so we did, we were like complex carbs, bodybuilding, whatever, prior to, uh, prior to paleo, then we found paleo, then it was paleo low carb, then mm. it was keto, then it was keto intermittent fasting. Mm. And then after that, it was, it was still intermittent fasting, like cyclical intermittent fasting right. with safe starch paleo. Uh, and like, we were like mixing, we mixed, we were mixing keto, cyclical intermittent fasting. And then like the idea of like having high starch or high carb days and those high right. carb days had to be safe starches. Right. And it was, yeah, it was like cyclical keto on the non-workout days and the workout days, we, that was like our cheat of having some carbs, but it still really wasn't much. Like we were probably still potentially keto. Like a hundred, 150 grams max. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also had in there, uh, we were still doing like intermittent fasting days on the days that we weren't working out. Mm -hmm. I remember like you had some intermittent fasting days in the week and I was, we were like trying to plan them together and all that <laughs> stuff. So that we were fasting the same days. And then after that, I think the, I think so like we were slowly transitioning to carbs at this point mm -hmm. and it didn't take us long to start eating carbs and being like, wow, we feel a lot better. And then we found, I remember then you found Danny Roddy and this is right. where Danny Roddy came in and he started talking. You can actually, you go ahead and you explain it because you, you instigated it. Yeah. 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 So to, to clarify also prior to, so I had never made that connection that you made with like the whole grains and, and stuff with how I felt like I, mm -hmm. there, that correlation was there, but I, I didn't really make that connection. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So we were starting to experience symptoms like on the, that's why we kept adjusting. That's why we would go from keto to the intermittent fasting, to the cyclical keto, to just carbs on workout days. Like first off cravings were insane. Like we were having insane carb cravings. I was, I remember like being so obsessed with food also, like we would cook all of our meals in the morning. 
and it would be like ground meat and like pounds of vegetables and then Mm -hmm. with like fat poured all over it like olive oil and butter and whatever and i would slice up avocado from our avocado tree that we had at that house and throw that on top too and we used a ton of herbs and spices because those just had a ton of antioxidants and they were just so healthy (laughs) there was no possible downside to that um you know so all of our stuff was orange or yellow from turmeric and then we would also have like rosemary and oregano and uh thyme and stuff and basil um and so so that was like our meals and i remember i was never not we i would bring my meals with me to to um to school and i would like spend my whole day at school and come back to the house at night i would get my workout in there i would do all my studying there and that way when i came home uh you know i didn't have to worry about any of that and I remember just ne- like always looking at the clock, waiting to when I could eat again. And once I was done eating, I was just, all right, I got this this many hours until my next meal. I was just so hungry. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and, and it's, it's a terrible feeling beyond the some of those other things I'd mentioned, just like general lower energy, not feeling great with the workouts. I remember you were having some trouble like focusing and studying at this point compared to before. Yeah. Yeah, I was having a, a huge problem with that. Yeah, I remember you guys would try and study with me, and I was just like, I could not focus. I right. was so, <laughs> I was out of control. Like just, I would just be messing around the whole time, and yeah. then until I would, and I remember we just, I was craving sugar too. Mm-hmm. And then for me, it wasn't meals; it was sugar. It was like I want sugar. I would need sugar. I want carbs. Like I couldn't wait until I could have my white rice with cinnamon on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't just have plain white rice, so we definitely have to have. It cinnamon. had to have cinnamon <laughs> to increase our insulin sensitivity. Right. Yeah, and it was yeah, it was just so uncomfortable, and and um, you know, we had to put ourselves in such a fully regimented, uh, like so structured, so regimented, and it, you know, and tying this all back to how like mindset has shifted as well. There's so much less room for curiosity and investigation and new experiences and like such a such a closed minded worldview that kind of came with it um that is really i feel like opened up a ton later on and it became so much like i remember a lot of animosity then too like especially with like my professors that would be talking negatively you know just saying like whole grains and low fat and whatever and you know saturated fats are bad and cause heart disease and i, I remember so much uh you know anger around that and i think those things shifted a lot too as as we moved forward and so yeah you had mentioned that because everyone would tell me that my hair was thinning it back, I, that was something I was looking into. And that led me to Danny Roddy's book titled Hair Like a Fox. And uh, and so I know I mentioned I found that video of his earlier and, and I, that was, you know, I kind of recognized him from that. And so I remember reading that book. Um, I kind of, I think I read it before even like saying much to you about it. I was just like, you know, you know we would kind of talk and I'd be like, oh, this is, there's this interesting thing. But I read through it and I remember just being like, all right, carbs are the way to go. Like it was just like fully convinced, um, you know, just such like a such a different you know, such a shift in mindset and different way of looking at things. And so much that I didn't understand either, like was so far beyond my understanding, but also like just really hoping for anything that would tell us that we could eat carbs. I'm just laughing because I remember when you brought up Danny's stuff to me and you showed me like he had a video series with hair like a fox. Mm. And I remember I went through the book and I went through the video series in one day. Like I just sat down and I went through everything in one day. Mm. And I remember being done with it and being like, like I had questions. I was like, I was like, there's no way that fructose is good. But at the same time, like Danny was saying it was okay to eat carbs. And so I was just like, okay, let's go get some carbs. <laughs> yeah, I you were being so happy. I was, yeah. I was like, let's get, like, let's go get juice. Let's go yeah. get some orange juice right now. <laughs> which, which honestly, I mean, and, and that wasn't what happened. We were still like, there was a long time where we were still anti-sugar or scared yeah, of sugar. And we were like going back and forth, like arguing about it, thinking about it for months. But mm-hmm. I just remember the first time I was like, for me, I was like, let's, okay, let's just try it. And like, I knew I, what, what resonated with me is that we, is that I was craving carbs so much mm-hmm. and I didn't have an answer for why. And it's like, this is, this could be an answer. So I, for me, is like this, he seeded the idea in my mind and then I couldn't like get away from it because it like, there's some part of it made sense. Mm-hmm. And so like, we back and forth, back and forth for a while until eventually it was just like, all right, let's just, let's just try it. And then the other thing was that I wanted to point out is that we were constantly adjusting our diets 
at least and looking back on it, it was like because things weren't working well, like there's problems. So we were trying to figure it out. But I feel like our mindsets at that time was like, oh, this is it. This is the way to go. And that's it. And we were like, so like a lot of the struggle was instead of being open to like, okay, well, what if we do this? What if we do that? It was like, we were constantly fighting ourselves with, oh, we have to do things this way. It has to go that way. It has to be done this. And we were just like, this is the only way. Like we were very rigid with it consciously, mm -hmm. but subconsciously there was a part of us is like, this shit ain't working. <laughs> it's just not working. We're craving too much carbs. We're having like X, Y, and Z issues. And then Danny Roddy sort of like opened the door from our subconscious mind of like, this isn't working to like, well, maybe like, here's a rationale, here's a theory for why these things could make sense. And our, we perseverated on it. We argued about it. We debated it. We mm -hmm. like went through it for so long. And then finally, I remember we, I think we one day it was just like, let's just get orange juice. And it's like, go ahead. I, I, so there, there was a, a decent period before we actually jumped into the orange juice and dairy and honey where like in that kind of contemplation stage that I wanted to mention, uh, where we had that kind of intermediary period where it's very starch based. So you were eating like you, you especially instigated this with the plantains. <laughs> uh, yeah. you were, you would eat like five plantains. a day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and just a really <laughs> funny side story that I'm always gonna, like, I'll never forget this is that when you, uh, <laughs> you would always cook up your plantains earlier and bring them with to, to class and you were running late. And so you like left the house and biked to, to <laughs> school and then realized that you left the plantains at the oven. What was it like halfway through class? And then you had to bike back and like the whole house was fully smoked out and uh, you like open the oven and everything was, like they like caught on fire and you had to just let it burn out. And then our house was so smoked out that all of the ants that were living in the walls and in the attic came out. It was not a nice house. No, like, it wasn't. Like it was completely infested with ants. We were in Miami, so like and mold. Yeah, mold and ants. But like I had smoked out the whole house, so like every hole in the wall, like it was it was really just a, a gross house. Like I can't begin to describe on here how gross it was. But yeah. we didn't care. We were in college. We were having a good time, but yeah. I didn't think the mold was actually partly a problem for some of our stuff, but every hole in the wall like where somebody had put a nail in or a screw in for pictures or there was like something, some hole in the ceiling or whatever it is, or like there was a crack somewhere. When we smoked, when I smoked out that house, no matter where you were, ants were coming out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, was, it was disgusting. And there was, there was a hole over the, the stove. And so ants would fall onto our food and we were cooking it that we night. Yeah. 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 Luckily it only lasted a day or two until like kind of even out, but. Oh, that was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so for a while after we were doing this kind of high starch, we were really into banana chips at the time. Um, we were still not doing dairy. We were still doing a ton of vegetables. We were still doing a lot of fish. Uh, we were still doing like salmon, you know, still getting the omega threes. We were doing a lot of muscle meat, a lot of chicken. Um, and then we, and that continued to transition towards like, recognizing that food was good and calories were good and wanting to eat a lot. So we kind of did this like really high starch, a ton of plantains, like 5,000 plus calories a day, uh, but still eating salmon, still like like kind of half in, half out, like one foot into the repeat sphere and one one foot out. Yeah. And we were, so we were eating a ton of food. We were still working out. We were putting on a lot of muscle, um, but we were also... That was the period where we both went from like 180s to like, almost up to 220 right. just in like a month or two because we finally added in carbs and we were working out consistently yeah i don't know if it was quite that fast but yeah we we put on a lot of weight and a lot of it was muscle too and yeah and so we were eating a ton but we also like pretty bloated uh decent amount of weight gain that and not all of it was lean um i remember having a, a lot, lot of water weight mm -hmm, a lot of water weight cold hands and feet still like hunger and cravings wise we were satisfied like we were eating even when we weren't <laughs> hungry like because the hunger was nonstop. like it was insatiable hunger that we would just eat so much food and having you there was so helpful for me as because i was still like coming from fearful restriction like still so scared to trust my body but having your encouragement <laughs> just like eating <laughs> tons of plantains all the time um, and just see, like it just gave me permission to to do these things and we started adding honey to and maple syrup to the plantains also oh that was so good yeah um <laughs> i remember the i remember we were uh we wouldn't let ourselves eat the sweet plantains because like only a certain amount cuz there was right. so much sugar in them yeah we were still limiting fructose 
Yep. And then eventually it was just like the only ones that we wanted was like the sweet plantains dow- uh, cooked in or fried in butter or like yep. broiled in butter and then doused in maple syrup or honey. Mm-hmm. I remember just like really, really loving those. And then eventually like only getting sweet plantains and just right. like, I don't like the starchy ones at all. Like just anytime I'd make them, like not eating all of them, like, oh yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and so there, there was that period. Um, and then we were also doing white rice with like cinnamon and and sugar. Remember we were putting like sugar in there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and so, just a little bit. Right, right. Just yeah, It was just, just for taste. It was just for taste. It wasn't like a full <sighs> tablespoon of sugar. It was just like a little teaspoon for taste. Right. I'm sure it was still within our fructose limit that we set for ourselves, which kept getting larger and larger. It was like first it was like 50 <laughs> grams a day or like 20 grams a day, then 50, then 70. We were still limiting it, though, even though we were having like 600 grams of carbs sometimes. Yeah, it was all starch. Yeah. And so we, we had a lot of symptoms at this point and we were kind of half in, half out. But it was enough to convince us that this was like on the right path. And then so so then we decided to like jump in fully and we oh, actually, before before that, there was also a period where we started adding in more fructose. Like we were okay with it. And we did a ton of dried fruit like we were eating bags and bags of dried mango. Yeah. And I remember at that point, too, I was I've mentioned this anecdote before, but we started doing more sugar, too. And I started putting sugar in my coffee for the first time. And I remember like my coffee. So I was roasting my own coffee beans at the time. And because you didn't, you you got you didn't want them to be moldy, so you right. got the green coffee beans and then mm-hmm. roasted them yourself. Yeah, from certain South American farms. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like it had to be wet process, like wash processed, high elevation, like the whole thing. I was very very into it, and still, I mean, I still think that there's value in getting the good quality coffee and paying attention to some of those things. But yeah. I also don't think it matters to anywhere near the extent when your metabolism is good, you can handle even suboptimal coffee. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the I wasn't the best at roasting it and I was still kind of in the mindset that like less is more. And so they were kind of under roasted, which I guess I mean, it would still keep a decent amount of caffeine because the caffeine becomes lessened when you roast it more. But I like the coffee was really, really weak because roasting it was like such an ordeal that I wouldn't want to use too many beans. And so I was kind of stingy with it. And so my coffee was pretty weak. And then I would add I remember counting 14 spoons of sugar uh, into the coffee <laughs> and it was like a regular size coffee cup. Um, it was just like just insane. It's just like sugar water, you know. It was insanely sweet. No milk or anything. We still weren't doing dairy at this time. Yeah. Um, Except for butter, large right, amounts of right. butter. Right. And I think this was also around the time we started eating. Like as we allowed ourselves to have more sugar, we started eating like straight sugar out of the bag, um, just like spoons of sugar. As we'd be like laying well, on the couch. That was the next stage. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're gonna wrap up this episode there and pick back up in part two, which will be the final part of this series. And in part two, we will be discussing the many mistakes that we made after finding Ray Pete and the bioenergetic view of health. We'll also be discussing our refeeding periods that involved eating over 5,000 calories and 700 grams of carbohydrates per day. We'll also talk about our experimentation with various supplements, including thyroid and B vitamins and fat soluble vitamins, various pro metabolic hormones, antibiotics, methylene blue and various other supplements, and also what we learned along the way while experimenting with these supplements. And then we'll also discuss how long it took for us to see major improvements and stability in our health, which is probably a bit longer than you'd think. And then we'll also be talking about why nutrition alone is not enough for optimal health, and also what other factors we should consider. And we'll talk about our experiences in authoritarian environments, especially within the education system, and how we worked to shed that dogmatism and uh, try to have a more open-minded view. If you did enjoy today's episode, then please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube, and if you're listening elsewhere, you can leave a five-star rating or a review on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast, and I really appreciate it. To check out the show notes for today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we discussed throughout today's episode. And if you are dealing with any of the symptoms that we experienced or described today, or if you're working through any of the diets uh, like we did and trying to sort your way through it, you know, maybe along the way you've been experiencing various issues. Maybe you're experiencing low energy or uh, low libido or depression and anxiety or joint pain or bloating or weight gain, uh, histamine intolerance or cold hands and feet. 
or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms or chronic health conditions, whether those are autoimmune issues or diabetes or insulin resistance or heart disease or any other chronic health issue, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to restore your cellular energy production, maximize your cellular energy, and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.